The following podcast is created and sponsored by High Beam Ministry. I believe that the Bible is supernatural. I believe that God is supernatural. He is still a God of miracles. Jesus Christ still works in and around us in miraculous ways. Mm-hmm. And I think that the world wants us to forget about those kinds of things. I think the world wants to undermine the Bible. Satan wants to undermine the Bible so that we have doubts as Christians. And he wants us to no longer trust that the Bible is being absolutely true. But I believe that the Bible is absolutely true. Jesus is talking to disciples on the Mount of Olives. It's called the Olivet Discourse. And in Matthew 24, Jesus answers their question about when is all this going to happen? All of the prophesied uh, events of the Old Testament. And what is going to be the sign of your coming? They ask him a couple of questions. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Welcome to the Airzats Coffee Shop. This is Jay, your truth barista, and I'm serving up a steamy cup of God's truth for the average Joe. You can catch me and this podcast on my websites, truthbarista.com, all one word, truthbarista.com, and highbeamministry.com. That's H-I-G-H-B-E-A-M ministry.com, as in car high beam. We're shining the light of God's truth on the road ahead. It's been a been a wild week here. It's kind of nice to sit down at the old counter here and uh, <laughs> grab a little cup of a macchiato here and just uh, kind of sip away. And, and I uh, sure hope that the brew is better this week. Last week when you were in, you said, nah, that new brew we're doing isn't very good. Yeah, it wasn't very good. It's good to see that you went back to the Costa Rica, and I happen to, that happens to be a personal favorite of mine, so yeah. thank you very much. But I'm excited that. because I just finished an old book that I had read years ago, and I just picked it up again and I read it and I'm so, man, this is good. It's The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah, and you know, Jay, good stuff in this, but you know, I don't hear any of this stuff being preached today anywhere. Our church doesn't preach it. Well, our church does preach it. What I find, too, is a lot of people are getting involved in prophecy on my side from the group I'm hearing from, but man, it's just like it becomes all-consuming from the for them and they just get free out and some people just get really hardcore about the whole thing. I'm beginning to think as the truth barista, we need to talk about prophecy. We need to we need to come face to face with it. You can't ignore it. And I don't think you can so immerse yourself into it and then become so dogmatic about it that you start scaring people off or start looking like a conspiracy theory. Well, person. and that is the two extremes, right? You hear nothing of it from most pulpits, or you got the other extreme where my point of view on God's prophecy prophecy is the only point of view, and if you don't believe in it the way I believe in it, I question your salvation. So those are the extremes that are out there. Right. And in the middle is nowhere. So we need to help, as you say, the ordinary person figure out what is prophecy all about. So what is it? Well, a prophecy is a major part of Bible material. That's something that you just see right away when you start reading through the whole Bible. And this is a key too, Larry. I mean, people have got to read the Bible from front to back. And when they do, they realize that there is a vast amount of Scripture that came to individuals through the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and a lot of this is prophecy. So, well, first of all, where did it come from? First of all, it says in 1 Peter, we should know this, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And this is a cornerstone of prophecy. Prophecy doesn't come from somebody's heart and mind alone. It comes through them by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes it a prophecy. But you're basically talking about the prophecy that's written down in the Bible. What? 
right. about prophecies that people say the Lord told me and then their own interpretation of something that I think they call it a rhema word. Right, a prophetic word. There is room for that. The Bible definitely talks about it. That is a truth. And they said, in fact, even Joel says, in the last days that people will prophesy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're not talking rewriting the Bible. We're talking a person being inspired by the Holy Spirit with a thought or an idea, uh, and it can come out as an encouragement or one of those things. But we're not talking about inspired scripture. They're two related, but two separate things. You know, and I think what you're initially talking about is the Bible aspect of it. Exactly. Because it's the safest, right? Right. The, that, the other rhema word could be really subjective and, you know, it, it can get pretty screwy at times. It, mm -hmm. There is a value to it, but the Word of God is pretty concrete. Because it's been sifted, it's been tested, it's been tried over millennia. Let's face it, if you start looking at the scope of Scripture, where did it come through? Well, you can go back to Daniel. He got dreams. You can go back to Ezekiel. And this is about 600 years before Jesus, okay? Daniel got dreams. Ezekiel got visions. They're all the same time period. If you move about 70, 80 years past, or into the, you know, 70 AD, let's put it that way, the Apostle John got visions. You can have direct encounters with God. Moses got it about 1,500 years before Jesus at Mount Sinai. You have Isaiah, who's back in the about 600 years before Jesus. He had a direct contact with God in the temple. It freaked him out, by the way. You can have life interactions. This is a really cool one. If you read Jeremiah, an example is God tells Jeremiah to take a belt and to hide it under a rock near a river. And then when Jeremiah pulls the belt out, he finds out later that it's spoiled and then God inspires him with a prophetic word based on a life experience. Then there are other people like Amos, who is one of the minor prophets. He was a shepherd, and God inspired him by pointing out things that a shepherd has experienced and used that to make a prophetic word. But here's the key. It is a revelation information directly from God to the receiving person. That's what a prophecy is. Now, these prophets, these people who are inspired by God, wrote these things down for the benefit of the current hearers and the future readers. And that's where prophecy is as far as the Bible goes. How much of the Bible is prophecy, do you think, Larry? Well, I, I kind of know this because I'm, I'm a little bit... Well, I, aren't I like you prophecy. a smarty pants? Well, I'm not a smarty pants, but I think it's about a third. It's a little less than a third. It's about 27%. You know, you round up, right? Almost right. a third. Yeah, it's almost a third. Now, how important is a third of something? Well, I think it's very important because if you take a third of anything away, that leaves you only with two thirds. Well, if you took one third of your oxygen away, I mean, you'd be blue most of the time. Exactly. You took take a third of the body's water away out of the cells, you'd be pretty much dead. Right? So if you take a third of scripture out of the Bible, you're going to find a very big problem, almost a dead book, because this is prophecy really is a heartbeat within scripture as well. It's very, very important. In fact, the first prophecy comes all the way back in Genesis. That's Genesis 3.15, where God looks at Adam and Eve and the serpent, and they've just gone through the fall, and he looks at the serpent, which is Satan, and he says, your seed is going to bite the seed of the woman's heel, but the woman's seed will crush your head by his heel. That is a very clear prophecy when compared with Jesus' life that Satan may hit him in the heel and wound him. But Jesus will turn around and ultimately crush Satan by destroying his head. There's a difference between a head and a heel. You're talking about the conquering or the victory of Calvary. That's it. That's the At crushing. The okay, that's the crushing of the Satan. Okay. Now, once again, there's two things. Some prophecies have a single fulfillment, some prophecies have a double fulfillment, and you can even find some prophecies that are going to have a triple fulfillment. We'll get into that in a little bit when, you know, when we talk about, I'm going to answer some of your questions regarding how to approach prophecy here, but when you're talking about Jesus' victory at the cross, Satan certainly wounded his heel, but did Jesus crush his head at the cross? 
Satan is still active in the world today. So that crushing aspect is coming at the end. And by the way, here's the last scripture in prophecy is Revelation 22.20. It's the second to last verse in the Bible where Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. And what's going to happen when Jesus comes quickly? It sets in motion the final events where Satan will be crushed. His power, represented by the head, his leadership, his dominion within the earth is finally going to be completely crushed. And that Genesis prophecy, the first prophecy, will be fulfilled by the last prophecy in Revelation. If you look at the entire scope of the Bible, Larry, you're going to find a vast panorama of prophecy that has to be connected and put together and interpreted in a proper way in order for it to make sense. And the problem is, prophecy really isn't all that easy at times to make sense of. Well, there's a saying today, many people use it, they say, well, at the end of the day, which means the conclusion of a matter Mm -hmm. means this. Well, prophecy is really at the end of the day. Right. Because it's God's plan as he reveals his covenants, he reveals his Messiah, he reveals the church and all of that. But at the end of the day, where does all of this lead? And so all of it leads to a prophetic word showing us and giving us confidence that God, not the devil, not the world, not you and me, Jay, that God is in control. That's what right. Do, what do you think about that? He started it, and he's going to end it, and it's going to go off into eternity. And it would behoove us to pay attention to what he has to say about it. God is in control. If God exists outside of time, because he created creation, which involves time, time is basically a measurement of how creation expands and collapses, and it tracks all that. But God is outside of time. Of course, he would understand everything that's going to happen within time. So, he has a unique perspective that he can speak to us through revelation of those who are listening to him, specifically the prophets in the Bible, those inspired men who wrote these things down for our edification and our preparation. When we first started our conversation, Jay, I talked about the late great planet Earth, and I said, I don't hear this in my church. Yeah, and why the, is that, do Well, you, you know, I read something somewhere that pastors who don't preach on prophecy say, well, God will take care of it and Anyway, it's too controversial. We don't want to divide the congregation because there are a lot of theories about how to interpret it and so forth. They just avoid it. But that's, again, avoiding a third of the Bible. Exactly. And the danger in that is what? We are not going to be prepared for those things that are to come. And God wouldn't have spoken it if he didn't want us to be prepared. Well, when we do the Olivet Discourse, Jay, what I discovered as I was reading it lately... Now, we should probably tell the listeners what the Olivet Discourse is. Yeah, that's right. Why don't you do that? The Olivet Discourse is a prophetic teaching that Jesus gave sitting on the Mount of Olives across the valley from Old Jerusalem. And during this Olivet Discourse, he was unfolding for his disciples what was going to be happening in the near future and the end of time and some of the events that were going to unfold between those two points. And it is a very fascinating bit of scripture. And I think it would be fun for you and I in some next programs to kind of walk through that and kind of share with our listeners the examples of how to approach prophecy and how to pull it apart and how to accurately understand it. As I was saying when I was reading the Olivet Discourse, the part that Jesus said that the last days prior to his return will be like the days of Noah. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of things we could say about the days of Noah, but there are two words that come out of that. One is unprecedented prepared, the people right. were unprepared, and secondly, they were totally unaware. Yep. Because they were unaware, they were unprepared, and of course, the flood came. But that's how God said we would be, the world would be, at the last days. So if we don't preach prophecy, we're totally letting people be unaware and unprepared. Exactly right. And there are things that are very clear in Scripture that are going to happen as indicators just before Jesus returns. And that's why I think we should go through the 
Olivet Discourse in the next couple programs because there are indicators right now of prophecy, Bible prophecy being fulfilled and having been fulfilled that clearly indicate where we are in a prophetic timeline. And we talked on our Israel program on two of those. Number one, Israel becoming a nation. In other words, the prophecies that Jeremiah and others said after a dispersion, God was going to bring all of his people back home. Well, some of the people came back home after the Babylon exile, but then they were dispersed again by the Romans in AD 70. And so what are we seeing in our day? More and more Jews are coming home. It's a process that's taking place, but the process can't happen unless they have a home. And that's where Israel, 1948, became a nation. That was a major prophetic mile marker. And the next one was 1967, when Israel took Jerusalem. Why is that important? Messiah is coming back. He needs a city, and he needs a throne. And he is the descendant of David, and Bible prophecy says that David will have a descendant who will sit on the throne forever. Now, that means one of two things. Either David's going to have descendants for eternity that will be sitting on this throne, or you're going to have a descendant who will sit on the throne for eternity. There's only two ways to interpret that word. So, that kind of brings up another topic, though. I think as we talk about, we're kind of prophesying ourselves here, in future programs, we're going to talk about the... God willing. God willing. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. So, to lay the groundwork, how should we approach Bible prophecy? Okay, it's very, very simple. Number one, you got to read it. You can't work with prophecy if you don't know what it is. So if you're not involved in the Bible, don't pick up your prophetic understanding by osmosis. You can't sit around and just take somebody's word for it because they may not be on track. In fact, I like the Bereans in the book of Acts. Paul came and he literally unlocked prophecy and showed them that Jesus was the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies for Israel. What did the Bereans do? Oh, yep, yep, I believe that. Yep. That, we'll take that one right away there, Paul. All right, you're right on track. No, they hit the scriptures, they unrolled the scrolls, and they searched it out for themselves to see if he was right. And as a result, many said, yes, you're absolutely right. That is a genuine interpretation of prophecy. Now, that brings up a very interesting point, though. There were many in Israel that missed Jesus as the Messiah. Why? Because prophecy is best judged looking backwards. In other words, after it's been fulfilled. When we try to project forward, we're kind of, there is an element of guessing. And because prophecy is related to events, and if events haven't happened, prophecy is hard to lock into place. So the best thing you can do is understand prophecy, make your absolute best estimate of, is this the prophecy coming to pass? And then as it comes towards you, you can say, ah, that was it. Let me give you this illustration. If you're driving along a highway, you get mile markers, right? It says mile marker this, mile marker that, and then you get a sign that says exit Bethlehem on this ramp here. So you're thinking, oh, the mile markers are the prophetic words that point to Bethlehem and say at this mile marker, you should expect this indicator called Bethlehem. And so when that sign comes up, you get off the ramp to Bethlehem where Messiah is born, okay? Well, you don't get off first and then see the sign to Bethlehem. You get the sign first fulfilled, then you get off the exit ramp. And that's how we should approach prophecy. We should learn it, and then we should watch as the signs and the events and these things go by. And that is how we keep ourselves safe. We don't throw all the eggs in one basket. We don't try to make prophecy happen. That's one of the accusations people have on evangelical Christians. Christians. We don't make prophecy happen. It will happen. We just have to recognize it as it is happening and then effectively point back and say, aha, that was that. Peter, remember on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit gets poured out, Peter looks at the event and he goes, ah, this is that which the prophet Joel said was going to happen. Now, here's an interesting thing. Is it what Joel said that was was going to happen? Yeah, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, there will be dreams, visions, and prophecies. We get it. But what Joel also said was, in those days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
Did all flesh get the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost back 2,000 years ago? No, which means Joel's prophecy has a double meaning. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a partial fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in chapter 3. The full outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to happen, Larry, when Jesus comes back. Very interesting. Almost like a... uh, Episodes. Episodes. Serial episodes, yes. There's one episode, but there's many more to come. Well, one of the things, Jay, when we talk about prophecy that I hear so often is people say, I don't like prophecy because it makes me afraid, because it talks about things I'm not comfortable with or I don't want to see happen. But repeatedly, the scripture, when it talks about prophecy, it always says, do not be afraid. And is that because God is saying, I tell you these things to not, so you're not afraid, but you know I'm in control. That's exactly right. I believe that too. You know, when, and Jesus will say it when we look at it at the uh, Olivet Discourse, he goes, I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you will be prepared, that you should not be afraid. And that's the point. And by the way, Paul talks about it too, that prophecy is there for the strengthening, encouragement, and comfort of the saints. Now, Paul's talking about prophetic words, but the same thing applies to biblical prophecy. It's not there to scare you into a heart attack. That's going to come from Jesus just world events anyway, you know, but prophecy is there to prevent the heart attack. It's there for the strengthening, encouragement, and comfort of the saints. So when people talk about in the end times, Jesus prophesied, yeah, there's going to be persecution and there's going to be martyrdom. What does that mean to us? That means that there will be Christians who will be killed for their faith. Okay, now think about the Christians in the Middle East who have, I mean, Christian persecution and martyrdom has ramped up tremendously throughout Islamic countries in the Middle East. We see those pictures of the men in the orange jumpsuits, those Coptic Christians, as ISIS led them to the side of the sea. How can these men approach this death with such just a a calmness on their face and they're not, they were just waiting? It's not just despair or hopelessness. They died with Jesus on their lips. Why? Jesus said, some of you will be martyred. And so when that time comes, knowing the prophetic scriptures, you can say, Jesus, I'm right in the middle of your plan. And Jesus also said, and behold, I will be with you even to the end of the age. And so, as these men were being martyred right there, they no doubt had a peace and they had a strength and they went to their martyrdom, realizing Jesus has also prophesied, when you get martyred, you're even going to have a special place with me because you stood firm in the face of your death. Isn't that great? I got to get back to the kitchen here. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's getting a little so I, let, what is the proper approach? Let's, let's just quickly take a quick peek at a proper approach to prophecy. Okay, really, really, really quick. First of all, you got to read it. Second of all, you have to look backwards at it as it passes. We talked about this, but we have to understand the principles of interpreting prophecy. If you can learn the original language, that'd be great, Larry, but not a lot of people have time to sit there and study the Hebrew or the Greek, but there are plenty of tools out there that have already done that for you. So you can use those. They're online, BibleStudyTools.com, various Bible programs. So get the original language. Use standard interpretation techniques techniques. Here's one. If something is literal in the Bible, you can't make it figurative. If something is a figurative part of the Bible, you can't make it literal. Your job as an interpreter is to figure out which one it is. So you have to look at the context. How is this prophecy shared? How is it spoken? Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering servant. So is that simply a picture of Israel, as many Orthodox Jews would describe Isaiah 53? Or is Isaiah 53 literal, that there is a single suffering servant. Well, when you look at the events of history, yeah, Israel has been abused. Israel has been scorned. Israel has been run through the ringer, so to speak. But when you look at Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, and by his stripes we have been healed. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was disfigured. We looked at him and we saw him abused and scorned by God. That's not Israel. That fits with the event that had happened in Scripture. Isaiah's looking forward, we look backwards and we go, ah, Isaiah 53. It's best fulfilled in Jesus, not 
Israel. So there's a literal versus figurative interpretation. We have to understand the history. What happened? What was going on in the prophet's life and in society at the time when that prophecy came to him? Jonathan Kahn brought that out in his book. Man, if you haven't read The Harbinger, you need to read it because talk about prophecy. Here he's found a small section in Isaiah that talks about how Israel was attacked by Assyria but came out of it on the other side still standing. And they didn't deal with the situation with repentance. They said, no, we're going to come back stronger and prouder than ever before. Well, Jonathan was sparked by the Holy Spirit. And he said, do you see the parallel between way back then and what the United States is doing now? And suddenly that prophecy in its historical context reflects something that's going on now with us in our context. Mm -hmm. And now there's a an application to it. It's yeah. really phenomenal. Uh, what's the name of that book again? It's called The Harbinger. By Jonathan, Jonathan C-A-H-N. C-A-H-N, right. Okay, and finally, once you've got the idea of the prophecy as it was given to the prophet in his day, now the trick comes pulling it forward. What does that say to us? Is this something that has been fulfilled? Is it something being fulfilled? Or is it something we have to sit and wait for it to be fulfilled? And so getting those some of those basic things down will really help you handle biblical prophecy. And by the way, there are some really good authors out there and some really good pastors and teachers who teach on this from a very balanced perspective. Avoid the ones who are sensational and avoid the ones who poo-poo prophecy that just kind of say, well, you know, I'm a pan-millennialist. What does that mean? It'll all pan out in the end. <laughs> you know, that is such a lame, lazy way of coming at Scripture. Just kind of sideline those guys. Well, I know when I read prophecy or I read books like Hal Lindsey's Late Gray Planet Earth or other related books, I get excited. I mean, it really gives me a boost in my faith and assurance that I know my God, the God I serve, the God of the Bible, that he has it under control. And that gives me an assurance that I don't have to worry about tomorrow or the next day or next week or year because God is there already taking control of it. That's one of the strengthening parts of prophecy. I love that too because when you see something come to pass that God has predicted 2,000 years before, such as Israel becoming a nation, out of threatened annihilation of the Nazi regime and the Holocaust, and suddenly Israel comes up, becomes a nation, and suddenly now they have 7 million people in the land of Israel. Hitler tried to kill 6 million of them, and now Israel today, in just a short generation, has already replaced that many in one land. I'm going, God's got this covered. And if he's got world events that, if he can handle world events that huge, he can handle the things in my life. And this is the point that how God uses prophecy. He uses prophets to foretell, which means to speak his heart right now to us. And that's what we need. We need those prophets prophetic words to speak to us, to encourage us, strengthen us, and comfort us. And sometimes it's called preaching. And that's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can talk to, it's called prophetic preaching. Okay? It's God's Word. In fact, pastors are often inspired by the Holy Spirit. Use this phrase. Put together your message in this way. Use this illustration. And then as the preacher speaks it, the Holy Spirit works on the receiver, and they are strengthened, encouraged, and comforted. The second part of prophecy is foretelling. Telling people what's going to happen ahead of time, so when it does happen, we are strengthened, encouraged, and comforted. And that's the things that we watch. Prophecy has been fulfilled. Prophecy is being fulfilled, and prophecy will be fulfilled. And there's coming a day when there will be no more prophecy. Why? It's all been fulfilled, and we're walking together with God into eternity. Well, this has been really, really good, and, and we haven't actually even got into the Olivet Discourse, but I guess we're going to do that next week when uh, you pop in. Yeah, yeah. I tell you what, I'll bring some of my resources. We'll sit down at a booth there and grab a nice cup of joe, and we'll sit down and we'll walk through this, and let's take as many episodes as we need to, to kind of unpack this and encourage people because, like I said before, Larry, we need to be prepared. There are things going on in our day that clearly show us that Jesus is coming soon. Well, you know, one thing I've learned about you, Truth Barista, you've got so many voices. I love that uh, Berean voice that you did. You got any other kind of voice as we uh, say goodbye today? Well, we were going to use the pastor I'm too afraid to speak about prophecy voice. Yes. I think we'll have to use that one. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, here I am from the pulpit, and I just possibly can't preach on prophecy because I don't understand it, and it would just freak people out, and I can't do that. So we'll use that one, and then we'll bring in a, the other one. What was that there? Uh, 
oh yeah, you might recognize this from a movie. Oh yeah, well how'd you like it if someone started pulling apples off of you? Are you saying that there's something about my apples that aren't right? So we'll use that one sometime too. The Bible teaches that nothing will ever change until the heart changes. The only way the heart changes is when God shows up and makes that change. When God is involved in a person's life, anything is possible. Thanks for joining us. This is Jay, your Truth Barista. Thanks for listening to the Truth Barista podcast. The best way to find out when a new podcast drops is through RSS feed. Go to our website, look for the RSS button, press it, and then enter your email. You'll be notified when a new podcast drops. Thanks for listening.